On December 3rd, 2020, the police were notified to arrest a 66-year-old man. His name was David Fuller, and he was arrested for the murders of two young women from all the way back in 1987. Now, when the officers got to David's house, they took a look around. They noticed a desk up against the wall, and they pulled it out, and they saw a pack of hard drives screwed to the back of the desk. It was obvious David put it there to try and keep it hidden away so that no one would ever find them. Some stuff stuck on the back of that one as well. Well, on the back of his oh. chest of drawers, it looks like he's got some hard drives in there, I would say. Oh. But they're stuck to the back. An officer put one of the hard drives into a computer while the rest of the officers were right next to him. They could not believe what they were seeing. I don't think anyone could have predicted what we were going to find when we searched his house. Are they ones he's taken? Well, why does that person look dead? This is the horrifying story of David Fuller, the murderer and necrophile who took hundreds of thousands of photos and videos of himself dead people. Let's go all the way back to the year of 1987. 25 year old Wendy Nell was born and raised in Tunbridge in Kent, England. Everyone who knew her just adored her. All her friends described her as a very generous, happy-go-lucky person who just didn't let much get her down. She doted on her niece and nephew and had a boyfriend named Ian who she loved so much and couldn't wait to start a family with him someday. She was a manager of a photo processing shop in Tunbridge, it was called Super Snaps, and it was just down the street from her bed sit. Now, for those of you outside of the UK, you may not know what a bedsit is, so I'm about to tell you. Basically, it's exactly like a studio apartment, but with a shared bathroom. And most of the residents who live there are very young working people trying to save up some money. Wendy loved photography, so she couldn't be happier about her job. And her coworkers described her as a hard worker. She was always busy doing something at that shop. On Tuesday, June 23rd, Wendy didn't show up for work, and she didn't give anyone a heads up, she didn't call out, so people were immediately worried. They were like, okay, this isn't like Wendy, like, why would she just not show up to work? Something must have happened. So they called her mom, Pamela, to ask her if she was with her, and her mom was like, no, but let me call her boyfriend, Ian. So the mom calls Wendy's boyfriend, and Wendy's not with him either, so Pamela asks him to please check up on her at her apartment. So he gets gets there around 11.30 a.m. He knocked on her door, but there's no response. He remembered that one of her windows didn't shut properly, so he went back through an alley behind the apartment and climbed through that window to access her apartment. And once he got inside, he looked around, and then he noticed Wendy was in her bed. He saw her head sticking out from under the bed covers, and he was like, oh my god, thank god, I was so worried. And as he was walking closer, he noticed her body wasn't moving, like at all. Usually, you know how when someone's sleeping, you'll see their bodies move up and down from their breathing, but no, there was no movement coming from Wendy and he got a chill down his spine. So he walked slowly and then carefully lifted the blanket cover. He was like, please just let her be sleeping. Please let her just be sleeping. But instead, he found his girlfriend's lifeless body. He was in so much shock, he ran out of the apartment as fast as he could to the nearest fire station and he was just crying his eyes out and he told the firefighters what he saw. He was like trying to catch his breath and he realized, oh my god, someone has to tell her parents that she's dead because in a few hours, her parents were actually expecting her to be at their house. Um, they had plans to celebrate her dad's 53rd birthday. Soon after the police arrived to the scene, they walked into the bedsit and they found Wendy's body on her bed and her body was severely there was blood everywhere, all over the bed, the floor, all her clothes, and her bag. There was even a bloody footprint on her blouse. The apartment was also very messy, but the police weren't sure if it was because she was just a naturally messy person, or if the mess happened after like a scuffle, an argument, or a break-in. The detective searched all over the apartment. They were hoping to find a murder weapon or any clues basically that could help them, but unfortunately they couldn't find anything. There was no murder weapon. 
However, they did notice that a couple items were missing from her apartment, but it was strange because like you would think that someone, if they wanted to take something, they would take something of significant value, like jewelry or cash or anything expensive. But instead, she was missing a, like a key ring, a keychain that she got when she visited Austria one time. And then her keys were missing and her diary was missing. The police went door to door. They were asking everyone questions, hoping that someone might have seen something or heard something. But it became super apparent that the building was used to like strangers and creeps because another woman told the police that the night before Wendy was murdered, she caught a man peeping right into her window. And according to her, the man said, you shouldn't leave your window open at night, especially in your bedroom. Detectives then consulted with a forensic criminal psychologist who who told them that whoever Wendy was a motivated sadist. The media coverage in the local papers was intense and all the women in the neighborhood were getting super nervous. I mean, can you imagine if someone in your apartment complex was brutally murdered by a stranger? I don't know if I could even sleep at night. These women were scared and rightfully so, but they were about to be even more scared. On Tuesday, November 24th, 1987, this is only five months after Wendy's murder, there was another young woman, 20-year-old Caroline Pierce, who was finishing up her busy lunchtime shift. She was a manager at a restaurant called Buster Brown in Tunbridge, and that restaurant was only 400 yards away from where Wendy worked at Super Snaps. That night, Caroline and her friend had plans to go out for a drink, and her friend was actually the chef who worked with her at Buster Brown. They decided to go to an Italian restaurant, and the two had a beer and they chatted for about 35 minutes, and then they said their goodbyes. Now, the chef friend went back to work at Buster Brown, and Caroline called a taxi to go back to her apartment, which was only about a mile away. The taxi dropped her off at around 11.50 p.m. and it was around then when neighbors heard a loud high-pitched scream coming from Caroline's apartment. Then she disappeared. Now her friends and family knew Caroline to be pretty spontaneous so her family was hoping that she was just away somewhere for a few days like she had done in the past. But as time began to go by and she wasn't coming back and nobody heard from her, people were starting to worry. Caroline also never showed up to Buster Brown to pick up her paycheck at the end of the week. And if anyone's traveling, they're gonna wanna pick up their paycheck. Police announced their investigation to find Caroline that Sunday, and they asked the public to contact them with any information. They did a search in her bedsit and found that her checkbook and her passport were missing. As the days continued to pass, a few tips came in here and there, but nothing was substantial. Her mom then released an emotional plea to her daughter, begging her to get in touch. But Caroline was still nowhere to be found. On December 15th, this is around three weeks after Caroline had gone missing, a farm worker was driving his tractor through marshland and spotted something in the levee. He couldn't tell what it was exactly, so he drove closer and then realized it was a body partially submerged in the levee. He immediately called the police, and when they pulled Caroline's body out, she was completely n except for a pair of stockings. Wendy and Caroline's bodies were examined, and it was clear they were both very badly and The pathologist determined that Caroline died after getting to her head. There were bruises all over her body, and they also found that her neck was indicating that she was her finger was also fractured, showing that she had put up a fight against her attacker. The news of Caroline's death started to spread, and at this point, everyone's dealing with the two murders in the area, so they're all panicking and worrying for their safety. One murder could pass as some horrible random tragedy, but two? And it was just a few months apart. All the women were being extra cautious, extra safe, and hyper vigilant. Parents even started asking taxi drivers to stay parked and to watch their daughters safely go inside their homes. Members of Tunbridge Wells Women's Group organized a candlelit demonstration where they held a moment of silence for two minutes, one minute for Wendy and one minute for Caroline. 
On December 27th, detectives let neighbors know they'd be launching a crime scene reconstruction of the night of Caroline's disappearance. If you don't know what a crime scene reconstruction is, it's basically the process of putting together all the pieces of a crime. It's kind of like playing detective and trying to find out exactly what happened. Investigators will gather physical evidence, they'll interview witnesses, and analyze everything to create a clear picture of the sequence of events. They take photos, collect fingerprints, DNA, then they develop a hypothesis about how the crime went down and test it using experience or computer simulations. Finally, they write up a detailed report summarizing their findings, and it's all about understanding the crime scene, how it happened, presenting the evidence in a way that helps catch the perps. So they hired a police constable who looked like Caroline to take the taxi ride from the restaurant to her apartment, and she let out a loud scream like Caroline was thought to have done on the night of her disappearance. She repeated this in four different locations, hoping it would help tell them the most likely position Caroline was in when she screamed, but unfortunately, the investigation was still difficult. In April of 1988, police told the media they had interviewed more than 10,000 people and taken over 500 statements. However, things were starting to slow down. Less tips were coming in and police just kept running into dead ends. Soon, Wendy and Caroline's cases seemed to have gone cold. The case was reopened briefly in 1994 when police announced they had arrested a man for what the media was now calling the bedsit murders, but it was soon determined that the man had nothing to do with those murders. And again, the case went cold. That's until 2007. So what happened that year? Well, thankfully, technology had advanced significantly. Police announced that they had used new forensic technology to create a full DNA profile of the killer using the found on Caroline's tights. This was exciting news because not only did they confirm that the murders were indeed committed by the same man, but they could also eliminate or implicate any past or future suspects. But they, they still weren't able to come up with any potential suspects. 12 years later, in 2019, police made another breakthrough while reinvestigating the case. Using DNA that was found on Wendy's bed, detectives entered the information into a DNA database and they were able to come up with 1,000 names of potential suspects. After a lot of hard work, the list was dwindled down to 90 names and they were able to obtain DNA samples from those with the closest familial links crazy is that going from having zero suspects for years and years and years then to a thousand and then 90 they were so close finally at the end of november 2020 detectives found an exact match to the dna sample and the man it belonged to was david fuller a 66 year old father of four from a quiet cul-de-sac in east sussex David was described as a quiet, friendly man who enjoyed cycling, bird watching, and photography. He spent most of his adult life working as an electrician at the local hospital. He was married three times and was known to have at least two affairs. One was with a nurse he met at work who described him as a quote, perfectly normal person, but the affair ended with her when he left her for another nurse who described him as a quote, perfect gentleman. Sally was his second wife and she was so sick of him cheating and his eye wandering all the time so she was talking to her friends about wanting to get a divorce and one day she and David were arguing and things got really really bad. David saw red and ended up kicking her repeatedly. She had bruises all over her body and a black eye. Eventually, they broke up and David married his third wife, Mala. Now, this marriage lasted a really long time, for over 20 years, and she's actually the one who was with him at his house when the police came to arrest him. So now, we're in 2020. The police were at his house. Remember, they found his hard drive hidden behind the desk, they saw what was in them, and they were horrified. They arrested him and brought him to the station. You're under arrest on suspicion of the murders of Wendy Nell and Caroline Pierce in 1987. When they took his fingerprints, it wound up matching with the print found on Wendy's bag, further proving that he was the killer. There was a lot of information that just started adding up about David. 
In the 70s, he was arrested twice for what police described as, quote, creeper-type burglaries, where he would climb into homes through windows. They also found that David lived in Tunbridge Wells at the time of the murders, and his grandparents lived in Romney, which was right next to the spot where Caroline's body was found. Now let's talk about what was found in David's house. They found photos of David wearing the same exact pair of shoes that matched the bloody footprint found on Wendy's blouse. They also found envelopes from Super Snaps, remember the store that Wendy used to work at? And they also found a diary entry from the same time which showed he had visited the Buster Brown restaurant where Caroline worked. Another shocking thing they found, and this is so creepy, his banking PIN number was 1987, which is the same year he, Wendy and Caroline. And this is the most disturbing of everything. Remember that hard drive they found that he carefully screwed into the back of the desk? Well, in those hard drives, there were over 4 million images of towards women and girls. There were hundreds of thousands of images and videos of David bot, and he did this with over 100 women and girls, the youngest girl being nine years old and the oldest being a hundred. I want to admit that I am admitting the offenses, but I don't really want to go into detail. Yeah. Okay. Um, I really appreciate that. And what offenses are you admitting, David? As you've just described to me. In terms of the actual yes. of corpses? Okay. And do you, do you know how many occasions, David? No. No. Have, have you been recording yourself doing those things? Recording yourself in the corpses? I admit that, I think so. The hard drives were dated from 2008 until November 2020, one month before he was caught, although it is believed that he started committing these crimes in the late 90s. And after years and years of practice, David had his method down to a T. So what he would do is he'd wait until all the staff had gone home and he had an all access key card. So he would use that to sneak his way into the mortuary and he'd always carry his maintenance equipment down with him just in case anybody walked in and asked what he was doing. So he could be a bodies and if someone abruptly came in and was like, what the hell are you doing here? He could be like, oh, look, I have my mop. I'm mopping right now, you know? He had also studied the placement of every single CCTV camera, so he knew exactly how to sneak around them without ever being caught. He would then record himself as he these bodies. These videos were horrible. Like, they showed David doing anything you could possibly imagine with them. He'd these bodies for multiple days in a row. He was very rough with them. He dragged them across the floor and just them, hoist them up into chairs and do awful, horrible things with them. Some of the women and girls were still wearing the medical equipment that doctors had used to try to save their lives, like defibrillation pads, catheters, and cannulas. Now another sick and twisted thing they found was he had a very carefully documented folder of every single one of his names and ages. And some of these folders were named things like Lord, register deadly deadliest and zero zero best yet he also kept a diary of detailed descriptions of what he had done to these bodies there was a cop who was responsible for looking through all this footage his name was shipley and after he went through the footage he was traumatized like i can't even imagine having to do that shipley initially thought he could handle it because these women who are being a are dead, so they're not alive. However, Shipley said he found folders which showed that David had taken his time to research all of his victims. Like he Googled them, he wanted to know where they lived, their social media, their Facebook pages, to see if there were any articles about them. And he basically wanted to know who these people were, how they died, and like what kind of lives they lived. Like he wanted to know who these people were. And because of that, the cops said that it became so much harder to separate just the bodies from who used to live in them. And Shipley unfortunately started having nightmares and hallucinations since that day. 
He received help from an in-house police counselor, but still struggles to this day. After David was taken into custody, police brought him to a private room to interview him, and he was charged with murder and Now, he initially denied committing the murders on the grounds of diminished responsibility, but he wound up changing his plea to guilty on the fourth day of his trial. In total, he pled guilty to both counts of murdering Wendy and Caroline, as well as 51 other charges, 44 of them which were related to of his mortuary victims. In the end, David was handed two whole life sentences for the murders of Wendy and Caroline, and he's actually the one of only two people in the UK's legal history to get two life sentences. During the sentencing, the victims' families were allowed to read out their impact statements, They were very upsetting, but it's important for the people to remember that his victims were not just numbers, they were not just bodies, they were real people who lived real lives and who were loved dearly. Wendy's boyfriend, Ian, told the court about how he had planned on proposing to Wendy on their trip to Paris and how he couldn't wait to start a family with her. Wendy's mom, Pamela, described how she has never been the same since her death. She talked about cutting down everything in her garden because, quote, it shouldn't be living and about how she would find herself sobbing outside at 3 a.m. with no memory of how she got there. The mother of David's youngest victim, remember the nine-year-old girl, she spoke about how after her daughter died, she would visit the mortuary to brush her hair and to leave her toys. She told the court about how she felt after finding out David would come in and violate her daughter after she left. She addressed David directly, saying, "You." she couldn't say no to the dirty 66-year-old man who was a I feel guilty I left her there. I will not enjoy my life again. In September of 2022, Jay Carr, who is the son of one of David's victims, Jordana Carr, took his own life because he couldn't live with the pain of knowing what that monster did to his mother's Now, while no amount of money can take away their pain, it was announced last year that the families of the victims would be entitled to compensation, where they would be able to receive up to £32,500 for psychiatric trauma. What most family members want more, though, is to see a change when it comes to the UK's next laws. For about a third of David's victims, police could only prosecute him for having images of him them rather than for the acts themselves. In fact, Nadia wasn't even illegal in the UK until the Offenses Act of 2003. Up until that point, it was argued that a dead body does not have rights and therefore is not a victim. As of now, Nadia is punishable by up to a maximum of two years, but one of the victim's mothers, Nevris Kamal, would like to see that change to 10 years minimum. It was said that the Justice Secretary, Dominic Robb, was examining the two-year penalty back in 2021, but it's unknown if there have been any actual advances made. In November 2022, this is almost a year after his sentencing, David pled guilty to an additional 12 counts of possession of a and four counts of possession of extreme between 2007 and 2020. David Fuller will spend the rest of his life in prison.